Okay, so we are going to talk about data flow and behavioral modeling in VHDL. Uh, it will sort of reinforce what we started discussing before regarding signals and how the concurrency is achieved in uh, VHDL modeling. So here I have a data flow description of a entity. So this is a comparator. So <laughs> it's a one bit comparator and what we are declaring is the ports. We are declaring A, B greater than equal LT, all of them to be input ports. Primarily if you look at the structure of this, so you have cascade inputs. and then you have the three outputs and this is your comp one. So in this case the inputs are A, B, G, T, e, e, Q and L, T. They are all bit one bit wide so this declared to be bit and the outputs are these are the three outputs and you can of course obviously cascade them and make a multi-bit comparator. So that is an entity declaration. This is followed by a data flow architecture declaration. When we say data flow, we are talking of concurrent assignments. So we have declared a signal S bit. So of course, as we said before, because we are associating this architecture to the entity called COMP1. So the, all the ports that are declared over here, they are visible within the architecture. All the input ports are visible as they are special signals. All of them inputs and outputs are signals except that the input, all of them which are declared as inputs can only appear on the right hand side of the expression and all of them which are declared as outputs can only appear on the left hand side of the expression. So what we have over here is signal S that is declared to be an internal signal of the, for the architecture declared within this and what we have is four statements. We will also look at how these four statements actually look like, but basically they are all concurrent assignments. What we have on the left hand side are signals and so they are concurrent assignments to these signals. The implication of concurrent assignment is the order does not matter. You can write these four, though you can say that this S that is generated, S which is on the left hand side is actually happens to be on the right hand side of these expressions. So they have all the expressions, three expressions, it is on the right hand side. So that is the meaning of data flow. The dependency is there, of course, because as the data flows, so as a new value of S is getting generated, the implication is this expression will be re-evaluated. Each time there is an expression, new value of S gets generated, this will... So the way to look upon it as each of the signals, there are a set of transactions and these transactions will result in some events these transactions whenever they happen to change the value then they will generate an event and these events will trigger off other transactions on other signals. So if there is value of S changes let's say from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0 there is an event on S and thus event on S will generate transactions on A, G, T, B, A, L, T, B and A equal B and one or more of these transactions could result in other events. So that is the implication. So if you look at it from the point of view of, so this is not really what we are talking of, it's not the really the implementation, what we are talking of is the model. So you can look at it as, as I said, these are the drivers, these expressions, so each of these expressions are getting implemented within this. And, and these are the inputs, so basically you can look at it as all these inputs are being fed just like you are feeding inputs to a circuit. Of course, it doesn't mean that I have to implement this circuit in any manner. I need not, that's a different, uh, you know, thing altogether how I implement it. But basically, the, this is, let's say, the expression and this expression is the one which is going to get assigned to this. So, if any one value changes, all the other expressions, in input, uh, any of the input signal changes, all the other expressions will be evaluated. And they are all acting concurrently. So, in data flow, there is also a, mechanism for doing a conditional evaluation. We will see later on another example of this as we go ahead in terms of and that is through what is called a guard. The way the guard works is primarily you want to restrict, you do not want an evaluation to be done at 
each time any of the signals change. You don't want this value to be updated each time the any of the signals change. Why that is so? The reason could be many. Uh, there could be many, uh, let's say, uh, reasons why you would like to do that. One is, of course, that physically there may be a situation where you are having something like an enable signal. That could be one possibility. But actually, more often than not, in terms of modeling, you want to actually cut down the times that this expression is evaluated. What we are saying now is this S is whenever this S or any of these inputs change, this expression is going to be evaluated and is going to be assigned over there. Obviously, when you are having a large circuit to simulate or model and then simulate, when you are having a very large design, then you are going to have such large number of this just one bit comparator. So, this comparator is going to be let us say 32 bit comparator you are making and there may be 100 such modules. And so, each time when you are going to perform a simulation, you are going to generate so many transactions and events. The time that it requires to perform simulation may increase. So, what you can do is parts of your design you can block. Either what you really know is you know somehow that these evaluations are unimportant. They are not going, we are not really interested in those evaluations. So, what you can do is you can make a block of statements which are all concurrent assignments and you can block that that particular block of statements you can put a guard condition. This guard condition will be evaluated and only when the guard condition is true all those assignments will, all those evaluations will take place and assignments will done. So, the, there this is basically what you are saying is I will, we will see one example of it and then it will be more clearer. So, what you are saying is this is guarded. Of course, when we say this is guarded, what is the guard condition that should appear within so, the, I should have indicated it should appear within what is called a block statement within a block and we can associate a guard with a block. Just to see Andrew, what, what are the type of situations when one would be having such a guard, this shows. So, the role of guards is conditional evaluation of the signal assignments, controlling concurrent assignments. This is what we saw. Clocking of registers. You can have, for example, inputs may be changing, but you can have, you do not really need to bother about input changes unless when the, let us say it is a, you are want to implement it as a clock register, which is let us say a rising edge or falling edge. So, only at those events you are interested that the evaluation should take place. So, you can put that as a guard. Similarly, buses, buses could be guarded because there could be an enables on the inputs that are being fed to the bus and then you can put guard statements on evaluation of buses. So, there could be many reasons why one could be doing that and the implication of all that would be to cut down on the evaluations and then finally the assignment of that. Let us look at a, a RTL description now. So, this is a behavioral description and it is uh, it's a description <coughs> where we are now so, this is all actually part of the process. What I am showing you here is all part of the process. I already have given you the syntax for that. I have not written here the process declaration, but this is all part of the process. So, let us look at each part of it and see how it works. So, what I have over here is while in ready, in ready is an input, this an in bit, it is part of the and what we are doing is we are checking loop and loop and we are what we are doing is we are checking whether in ready is 0. So, while in ready is 0 I do wait until clock rising. Okay. So, the uh, clock rising essentially means clock event and clock equal to 1. So, this is the condition of clock rising. Sometimes clock rising is defined as definitely simulators use this clock rising as an event which is defined. So, that means it is a rising edge of. So, please remember clock is not a keyword in VHDL, clock is just the clock is also an input uh, signal, that is all. So, we are looking for whatever is this clock rising. So, these two are equivalent. This says that clock is an event and clock equal to 1. So, this will actually detect the rising edge. So, what we are doing over here is we are converting an in ready is an asynchronous signal. If you consider this description, it 
in ready is an asynchronous signal and it can actually change from 0 to 1 any time. But this particular thing is acting on a clock. And so what I want to do is I want to do a synchronous wait. I want to wait till this rising edge when my... So this rising edge, it will be, while it is 0, it will be in the wait state. But when I actually get this rising edge, when... So I will proceed because I will come back and check this loop only after at every uh, rising edge of the clock because there is a wait. So this is within the process and in a wait statement in a process essentially suspends that process. The execution of that process gets suspended till we, whatever is the event that we are waiting for, in this case the event that we are waiting for is the rising edge of the clock. So what this does is anything that you put like this at the beginning of the process will imply a waiting, we are making a synchronous wait for an asynchronous signal. The signal is asynchronous, but we are converting it into a synchronous wait. I will wait only multiple number of clock cycles. When I quit this loop, I will essentially will have, the time would have proceeded to this rising edge. Okay, because then this condition will not be satisfied and I will, my loop will be ending. But till the condition is satisfied, I will be in the loop. So now I have these statements, in port 1 and in port 1 and in port 2 are the other two ports. From this I am making an assignment to X. Within the process, the order is important. But of course, because you are not specified any time delay, the right hand side is, there is no delay that is assigned. So what happens is, you make the, evaluate the expression on the right hand side, assign it onto the signal on the left. But without any delay, you proceed to the next. So what you are doing is, so at zero time, so this is basically getting us, this is going to be evaluated, this is going to be evaluated and assigned. But actual assignment, because I have a wait statement, when I start suspending it for any event to occur, so this I have indicated before, I could also say, wait for x, in this case, or wait for y any of them I can say. So what it means is I wait for an event on X or an event on Y. As we said before, this, uh, the notion is of a delta delay. So this assignment actually will take place. The zero delay here essentially means delta delay. The delta is so is going to be assigned after delta delay. And that delay gets completed when I say wait for X or wait for Y. I can say anything. But of course, this will not mean that the simulator will move anything forward or there will be no real physical time delay that will be associated. But what we are doing over here is wait until clock rising. I am waiting for the rising edge of the clock. Remember if I am going to model. So now please uh, you have to start now appreciating because you will also be using your VHDL synthesizer in the lab some of you definitely and also you will be doing some simulation as part of the assignment. You have to start understanding the differences over here. If I am going to implement this X and Y in a register which is a, let's say a rising edge triggered register, I need this wait, in, wait until clock rising to actually complete this in my physical implementation of this design, actually it will only be at the rising edge of the clock that this data is going to get latched. So the synthesizer, the VHDL synthesizer actually understands this and interprets it in that manner that this particular X is going to be in a register where I will essentially be latching with the clock. The model of the simulator doesn't really require this clock rising for completing this transaction, completing this assignment. This assignment is essentially, but because a physical register which is going to store the value of x or value of y, so in this case both of them is going to get stored available. So this is an interpretation that comes only when you do the synthesis. So this is a, something that one has to be careful when one is writing a synthesizable model, one has to be careful about these delays that are occurring because of the implementation that you have. Now let us look at the next case, while x not equal to y loop. So this is, I am looping and if x greater than y then wait until clock rising. x is assigned x minus y else wait until clock rising. On both sides I have 
uh, I'm going to wait until clock rising and then I'm going to assign y is assigning y minus x and this is going to be in the loop and any such loop which is a while loop which actually requires a concurrent assignment which is going to be mapped onto sequential logic should have if it is synchronous design as, it, as the case in this case there should be a wait until within the loop if there is no wait until clock within the loop then you will be and if you want to actually implement a assignment onto a synchronous logic it will not work that means it will be going without any delay. So, there is a going to be one clock cycle at least that is going to take place because and your model should fit in in terms of when the data is going to be registered in terms of the clock and the computation time that you are allowing for the subtraction. In this case the subtraction or the comparison so that you have to. So, this particular part actually can be written in number of ways we will perhaps take it up in the next class I will show you some differences in terms of timings. But for the moment, let's just what I want to emphasize over here that any such. So, what you are basically doing in RTL behavior is for one thing, you have actually have made some decisions regarding how you are going to implement in terms of the registers, in terms of you know the we can I will also show you how you can actually perform these operations on some actual components. How can you indicate that there's a ways of writing that. But please be clear that all such loops, if it is a synchronous loop, you need to have some wait statements. Of course, in this case, because it's synchronous clock, single clock, so you should have to wait for the clock. Only then you can synchronize all events to occur at the clock. In this description, I am not really bothered about the actual delays in terms of the nanoseconds and so on and so forth. What I am assuming is in this level of the model, what I need to do is I need to split my algorithm or to decompose my algorithm only in terms of my clock steps. And all the delays that are going to occur because of the components, my clock delay period is large enough to accommodate those. That is the assumption under which the model is written. But this need to be verified at some time. When you are actually doing the implementation, when you do the simulation, you will actually map it onto some components and those components later on, as we said that the architecture could be at different levels. Each You can write, this could be a architecture for a GCD component and you can write this, this is written in a, at a level, abstract level where you are not talking of delays. You could also write another one with delays. Similarly, subtract rate itself could be implemented with gates and the gates could have an associated delay and finally, when you do the simulation, you can verify that your clock period is large enough. We will see an example of this uh, in the next class when we take a more detailed state. So, this is one type of a process statement, the process I told you, where we have, what we have done is we have split this into various uh, clock cycles, the activities that need to be done in various clock cycles and return a description at that level. So, when you write a description at this level, this is what is called a true to the clock cycle. So, behavior is going to be true to the clock cycle, like basically all the activities, so whatever modeling that you are doing, any interfacing you are doing of this component with the other components, you can actually predict its behavior up to the clock cycle. You can could talk of delay models which are smaller than this, not, you know, more let us say finer than this, even let us say true to some nanoseconds or tens of nanoseconds or even 0.1 nanoseconds, depending on what, how accurate the models you have of your components. But many times it is sufficient to stick to this level of as far as this, let us say your implementation of your projects and so on and so forth, it will be sufficient for you to decide really at what happens at the clock cycle level, not to go beyond that. Of course, when one is doing a very fast designs, when one is trying to exploit, when you want to speed up the design, then we have to go down below the clock cycle. So, there we had number of statements number of wait statements and each wait statement we said wait until clock rising. So, this of course, as I said, these are equivalent. I say clock event and clock equal to 1 or clock rising. So, we had number of statements and all of them indicated one clock cycle delay. Of course, we had a loop which was not, it was not going some definite number of times depends upon the data, but still it will be going some multiple clock cycles which is exactly predictable once you have which data that you are computing the GCD for. This is another type of a process. What we have is we can have we process assignment and conditional constructs. We will see some example of this. We will see a finite state machine 
example of this and we say wait until clock rising. So if I uh, say like in this manner, then process body is executed in single clock cycle. So I'm not really, whatever I'm doing within this particular process, I'm going to execute it in one clock cycle. I have no other wait statement. Please remember these are all assignments and conditional constructs. They are all, of course they are sequential because they are within the process, but they don't consume any delays. And we finally wait for the clock cycle. So there are a number of ways that I can actually transform this. Of course, this is one way of writing it. Each iteration of the process of a different, because if you have if then else statements, conditional constructs within this, then I may be performing different computations. That's a different issue, but I can do that. I can also have what is called a sensitivity list. Process clock. So I can put this clock in the sensitivity list and I can say begin if clock if sorry clock equal to 1 then I can put this whole process over here. That will actually essentially mean the same because if I put this in the sensitivity list then I cannot of course use the wait statement as I said you cannot mix the sensitivity list and the wait statement. So what happens in this case is whenever there is an event on clock, the event on clock happens at the rising edge as well as the falling edge of the clock. This particular process is getting, going to get triggered, but I am going to execute it only if clock equal to 1 and not. So basically, these two will behave simul similarly. There are some small differences how, they ini how initially it works, but basically both of them is going to get triggered every clock cycle, every rising edge. So the same operations are going to be performed, so one can also do it in this manner. So now let me look at a finite state machine, uh, which is a fairly easy thing to do in VHDL. So those of you who would like to do the design of your controller is a state machine. One can choose a VHDL description for doing this. This is a finite state machine description which is written in a manner that we have only one wait statement with clock. So I have a process. This is a state machine begin K state register. So I already defined the state register. We, the, there is also a possibility of having you know, uh, user defined types in VHDL. So those details I am not going, you could always look into that. So you are quite familiar with other languages. So you can define you know, enumerated types. So you can have various states or you can also encode them. If you are encoding, you are doing manually, you can encode them. You can declare it to be some sub range of an integer type. And for various values of the integers, you can say that what happens. So what you are doing now is you are looking at the state register, K state, and when so when this is valid, then perform this. When this is valid, perform this and so on and so forth. So you are writing all your state transitions. You are doing two things. You are writing the state transitions and you are also writing the outputs that need to be assigned for each of the states. So you can write in that manner. So whichever statements that need to be assigned and then you say end case and then you say wait until clock rising. So what will happen is all this, so as part of it, let's say you are going from state 0 to state, so the state register will also be assigned as part of one of the statements, it will also may be assigned some state 5. Let us say this is where you want to go. So there will be a statement here, state 5, assign that to state register. But this particular statement will get activated when I go for the next clock cycle. So this is going to be part of the loop and this makes the whole thing synchronous. So what we are doing is you have a synchronous model of your state machine, so where all state transitions will be synchronized and it's good enough to write a description like this. No, 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 that's an event on, that is a, you know, when I want to specify the event, so that's a, that's an, called an attribute definition. So that's part of the syntax. So you have to say clock, whichever is the, so this is the event that we are associating with that, this. Okay, so you, there are some specified ones like rising and uh, you can say clock event if you say then, so this is a part of the syntax. 
Okay, so that's not complement. <coughs> okay, so this is a uh, uh, simple way of doing state machine description. See, one thing that uh, I would like to tell you is that when you are doing using synthesizable VHDL, when you want to use VHDL to realize the component, you are, you are in a much more restricted domain. You have to be careful about how you are using the language. The language, first of all, constructs that are allowed by a synthesizer, first of all, is restricted. And also, the styles that you can write your description is also restricted. You cannot write arbitrary descriptions. In simulation model, you can, of course, simulate and see if your description matches what you are looking at. You can be satisfied. But not when you are doing synthesis. You have to be more careful when you are doing synthesis with VHDL. So, I just to give you the how the uh, data flow model for the same state machine works. So, now this is a construct for the block. So, I have can define a block and I can say end block. Anything that is going to be so that is the that is part of the block. So, this is you can also nest blocks. So, if you nest blocks, then the last nesting is if you write a statement and if you say guarded then it will be the last statement within that that will be. So now if I say block, so now what you are saying is clock rising, this is the condition. So whenever this particular block is going to be activated, please remember this block statement is a concurrent statement. The equivalent of this is actually having all these statements but they are all guarded by something. What is this statement guarded? <coughs> this statement is guarded by <coughs> So whatever that you are going to do, so this is very similar to what we had before, except that now what we are doing is begin statements for whatever statement, whatever transitions that you want to perform in state 0, whatever output assignments you want to perform in state 0, that you are putting it again within a block. This is a nested block. <coughs> and what I am saying is state register, I am checking the condition and this condition, so what is the block for, what is the condition for this is this and the guard that came from the nesting under which this is there. So basically that these concurrent statements that are going to be there within this, within this particular block are going to be essentially activated only when the state register is in state 0. This as I told you depending on what type you are declared, this could be an integer value or this could be a enumerated type where you call them state 0, state 1 and the condition. So, these two together now perform uh, act as the guard for the statements over here. So, similarly I can uh, have for state 1 and state uh, state when I can have a different guard. So, this is a data flow description. The reason it is a data flow description is there is this is not within a process. Please remember this is our all concurrent assignment statement. So, I can write such a state machine which looks very similar to this because there we are what we are doing is we are only doing having that uh, case statement and we have when case was there I was evaluating this, when case was there I was evaluating this. The same thing I have written in a different manner as a concurrent assignment within the block, but guarding it with different conditions. <laughs> okay, so the other point that I would like to make is regarding the test bench. Again, I will take up an example of this in the next class, but let me explain to you what a test bench means. This is a very useful concept in VHDL, so especially when you are doing simulation. What you can do is, you can actually write a completely, see, you are, you have a certain design that you want to test. This is what is called design under test and it has some inputs, it has some outputs. When I say this, I don't mean one input, it can have multiple, any number of inputs, but basically everything, you know. So, I will have an entity which will declare these to be inputs, these to be outputs and I will have an entity called whatever entity design under test and so on declared to be inputs and all. I can have something called an entity test bench which could be may not have any inputs or outputs. It is completely you know it is uh, as far as the input output ports are concerned they are null. There are no inputs, there are no outputs. Everything is enclosed within this. 
and within this particular entity i have could have number of things i could have a test pattern generator which generates the test inputs required for the design and the test i could have a clock generator which generates the clock that is required by the design i could have a unit for checking the result because i know that for this particular inputs these are the outputs that i am expecting and depending upon the model that i have over here if it is a model which is clock true it is true to the clock cycle and if it is expecting inputs in various clocks i should generate this inputs in various clocks so now what could have so this part of it because this is going to be concurrent with all these three things so you can have concurrent assignments over here you can have each one of them could be a process because this process will be concurrent with this process this process will be concurrent with this so all each one of them could be a process or each one of them could be a set of concurrent assignments and this is a very powerful tool because what happens is typically in a vhdl design development stage you always develop a test bench you start with with a fairly abstract model of the design under test and keep on filling up this abstract model replacing the components of that abstract model by more co you know finer models or which are at lower levels but as far as the test bench is concerned you typically don't need to change you can keep on simulating you can keep on changing the binding to various architectures which are at lower level you can go down and talk to the gate level you see you are supplying this let us say you had said your design should work at 10 megahertz this is your assumption that is 100 nanoseconds and you are generating your clocks with 100 nano data with your 100 nanosecond delays let's say it consumes one data every clock you can keep on going and once let us say you go to a stage where you have assigned when, when you have bound the architectures which are at the gate level and the gate level delays are visible and if the computation is not getting completed under 100 nanoseconds your data results will start turning out to be wrong so the same model we will again take up an example of this that you can develop a test bench and once you have a test bench and typically this is how i will advise you to do this any of the projects that you are doing you should start working with a test bench we should very clearly generate the inputs required and check your results you can even merge this that's all depends on how uh, you are doing the design and then refine keep on refining start from a fairly abstract model keep on refining and reach a stage where you can say either you can synthesize it or you have already reached a stage which is a structural design so there no synthesis required and you have gone down and the whole model is stru structural design of your circuit so this type of a flexibility ex exists in vhdl and that can be used very effectively for developing your uh, designs we will again see one example of it see these are all behavioral what we are talking of right now is behavioral but let us say you already have your data path comparators uh, you know adders whatever registers and so on so you can write a structural design we already talked of that port map statement remember we instantiate components and then we port map onto the component so that's a structural description no this is for example this is a behavioral description okay a structural description can be, i can write a structural description of this which will have only basically it's a net list i will have only components instantiation of the components and interconnection of the components when you go into the components the lowest level there will be behavior because any simulation will require the behavior but that will not at this level like you have the comparator comparator will be composed of will be built using let's say one bit comparators and the one bit comparators could be built using gates and they all be structural see even when i write the equation like this i showed you a one bit comparator this is again a, it is not a structural description this is again a behavioral description okay because these are the boolean equations which need to be evaluated structural will be consists of instantiations i will see show you an example of this it essentially consists of gates instantiation of those gates how they are interconnected and so on you can build a one bit comparator like this and then you can blow it up in terms of 
No, they are Boolean equations. They are not gates. Okay, so they they are not really treated. They are you can write any equation whatsoever. Finally, when you implement it, you may, for example, implement all of them using NAND gates. So that is the structure. The structural description consists of components and netlist, not of the behavior. So actually, data flow is also only giving you the behavior. So primarily, you have data uh, data flow, then algorithmic behavior which could be RTL could be part of it and you can have structural description. So these are the varieties of descriptions that you can have in VHDL and also it allows you for mixing these descriptions. That is there. Okay, so I think we will stop over here.